Again, these are some of his last words. He said, The Lord give mercy unto the house of Onesiphorus, for he often refreshed me. It was not ashamed of my chain. Hmm. But when he was in Rome, he sought me out very diligently and found me. The Lord grant unto him that he may find mercy of the Lord in that day. And in how many things he ministered unto me at Ephesus, you know very well. You've often heard me say there are two words, two days in the Bible, this day and that day. And here's of that day. He speaks of that day that's coming. He talks about a man by the name of Onesimus. And we're going to talk some about him today and Tuesday and Wednesday. But he used the word refresh, that he refreshed me. To give, it literally means to give intermission from labor, to get a break from. Uh, oftentimes we think of refresh, we think of a drink, some, some water. We often think of uh, refreshing in so many other ways, fellowship, connection, a good word at the right time. But it, it, it literally an intermission from labor, that you've been working and somebody came and refreshed you and gave you a break. I'm a man who lives under the umbrella of refreshment. My whole life, particularly ministry, has been refreshed. People have come into my life and refreshed me and caused me to refresh them. It is a reciprocating thing that takes place. It's, it's amazing when you are under labor, how many times you need somebody to come in and just give you a break. And just a little break can make it. And that's what Paul's saying here. Father, I thank you for your word. I ask your anointing to fall upon my lips, the hearts and the, the people to hear. I thank you, Lord, that the weather reminds us in this heat that we deserve it when we get cool. We thank you for your goodness in Jesus' name. And everyone said? Amen. Amen. God bless you. you. may be seated. When Paul writes this, he's writing it from a dungeon in Rome. Now, I, again, I'll just use my hands to let you know there was a time he was in Ephesus, and then he traveled across the waters. He ended up in a place called Melita, and the ship wrecked. He, there was a snake bite. You remember the story? He shook the snake off into the fire, then he went on to Rome. Remember the story? So I'm just trying to help you understand the end of, of his life. So there was a time he was at Ephesus, and that's the church. When we read about Ephesians, that's where the church had started, okay? He spent three years there, and then he said, I must go to Rome. Again, we're looking at a man who's in his high 40s. Paul never made it into his 50s before he was executed. It's important for you to grasp and take hold of. He has been a man who has been beaten. He's a man who has been stoned to death, rose from the dead, went back into the same town and preached. He's a man that's been flogged. His feet have been twisted upside down. He's been beaten on the bottom of his feet to the point where he couldn't hardly walk anymore, and yet this man still carried the gospel. He had a passion inside of him. He had something that drove him on. So captivity was the capacity to bring out both the best and the worst in people. Listen, if you've ever been incarcerated, it's either going to bring out the best in you or the worst in you. I'm not asking you to lift your hand, but I can tell you I have been incarcerated, and it brought out the best in me and the best in a lot of my friends and people that I met there. Some people go toward the other side. I have a young friend that just got out of jail, and I'm so excited to get to hug his neck in the next service because I know it brought out the best in him. You know, oftentimes we think of people that's been incarcerated in jail, prison, or whatever, that, that they're the worst of. No, they're not. They're the ones that got caught. So when I look at the Apostle Paul, he went to jail out of the goodness of the gospel. It was preached in the gospel just like in China or Iran or someplace right there. When you bring up the gospel, they'll put you in North Korea. They'll put you in jail. It doesn't make you a bad person. It makes you an evangelist. It makes you somebody that believes in the gospel. We don't feel that pressure here like they do there. But in his final days, we just read a small portion of the last words he wrote. And at some point, prior to this last letter, he had been let out of prison by Nero. He had to immediately settled back into preaching the gospel. He met with Titus in Crete. He enjoyed the company of Philemon and his new friend Onesimus. He was reunited with Timothy, his spiritual son in Ephesus. It is certain that he continued to pour wisdom, understanding, and grace to all these men that they fellowshiped. I can imagine just being around Paul, just to hear the things he talked about in his testimony. I just want to hear him share. I'm one of these guys that loves to be around preachers. I really do. I just like to get around. I want to hear their stories. I don't want to hear about all your successes. I want to hear about some of your failures. I want to hear about some of the miracles. I want to hear about when you didn't have a nickel a dime and God came through. That's just who I am. I, I love to hear about it. I know when uh, Miss Dolly's cut my hair for many years, she'll tell me about preachers that she's been around and she'll share stories with me about them. And, and, and I love to hear that. I hope you love preachers. 
At least one. So here, his freedom didn't last long. Suddenly finds himself confined to a chain once more. He's arrested in Troas, hauled back to Rome, tossed back into a dungeon. Dark and dingy, not fit for humans to be in. Odors of sweat and dried blood permeate the place. The fear of torture hangs like a fog over it. The gloomy chambers there in that prison. And from this hole, Paul pins these words that we just read. Nero was about to take off his head somewhere around 67 A.D. The greatest New Testament missionary and church planner will die in a disease-ridden, vermin-infested place. It doesn't seem fair. You would think that he would die in a, in a palace or among the prestige or have a nice laid-out coffin. It didn't happen that way. He, he died in a stinky, smelling... Uh, uh, boy, I could get really graphic with you. Older, his last few breaths was that of stench. I, I, I was listening to my pastor this morning as he told me about his daughter had a friend who went to Milwaukee and was complaining about the forest fire that came down from Canada. And, you know, the, the news is calling it toxic fire, toxic smoke. No, it's not. It's a fire. It's from wood. It's natural. It's not toxic, but here's the thing is our problem is we feel like we're entitled to fresh air. We feel like we're entitled to comfortable seats, that we're entitled to the best food, that we're entitled to the cleanest water. Where did that come from? Amen. Do you not remember watching shows about this thing called a dust bowl? And some of you were old enough to remember but I understand it happened during the Great Depression. A dust bowl came through Oklahoma and blew dust all the way into Chicago. Amen. It was, it was uh, I think at that time they, they were going through climate change. That's what it <laughs> We've always been going through climate change. Ch the climate will never stop changing. Amen. It's not an environmental hocus pocus to throw money at something. It's going to keep changing. But we got this entitlement, and Paul lost that entitlement as they took him toward the chopping block, the, the smell in that dungeon. Amen. Another thing, it doesn't seem fair to me. You know, again, fairness is not a part of our lives, but it don't seem fair that a man who preached the gospel, changed the world, wrote two-thirds of the New Testament, and yet here's a man going to lose his head in a dingy dungeon like that. And I'm sure that Timothy probably was quite disturbed when he read Paul's last words of how he was ready to be poured out like a drink offering and his departure from this world was very soon. Be careful that you do not get too caught up with the needing recognition or appreciation down here. Your recognition and appreciation may not ever be received here, but it will be received there. Because what we do here matters there. Can I get an amen? amen? Your reward will be on the other side. It's crucial to keep this in mind. The devil loves to take some of God's choices, servants, and work their minds over in the waning hours of their life and tell them they don't deserve what they're getting or, or this isn't right or this ain't fair. He loves to tell you that you've done wrong and try to remind you of your past. Keep this in mind. When Paul kept writing, he wrote in 2 Timothy 4, 6, he said, I'm ready to be offered, and the time of my departure is at hand. I know it. This is what I'm telling you. Paul got a heads up before he had a heads out. Some of y'all get that in a minute. <laughs> Amen. He had a heads up. He knew he was going to die. He knew it was coming. He knew when the key went inside that gate and they turned and they pulled him out of that cell that he, it was at hand. Amen. The time of my departure is at hand. Then he walks on. He said, I fought a good fight. I finished my course. In other words, he decided that this is the end. I've done all I could. And then he said, I kept the faith. You remember last week I told you that Jesus told Peter that Satan desires to sift you? like wheat, but I prayed for you that your faith wouldn't fail. Now we get to Paul's life, and he says, I kept the faith. Now listen, I may not have kept all my friends, but I kept the faith. I may not have kept all my health, but I kept the faith. I may not have kept all my wealth, but I kept the faith. I may not have kept everything that God poured on me, but I kept my faith. My faith is stayed strong. I didn't let go of it. I believed that God would save me, rescue me. So as I go to the chopping block, I know that God will put my head back on when I get to the other side. I'll get a new body. I kept the faith. As I walk through life, I realize my faith is the most important thing I got. 
Man, I've lost friends, I've lost health, I've lost wealth, I've lost finances, I've been down, I've been up. Life has been up and down, and I can tell you this over and over, I never lost my faith. My faith got weakened, but I never lost my faith. And what helped my faith the most is when brothers and sisters came next to me and refreshed me, that they didn't leave me alone. As I was talking to my pastor, he said, what are you preaching on that? I said, probably you. <laughs> because in some of my darkest times, pastor, you came into my life and you refreshed me. And he said, you, I reciprocate that. At times when everybody gave up on me, you were there. You brought Don and you brought, you brought your dog and you brought J-Bo up here to see me. In some of my darkest times, you refreshed me. It's a reciprocating. When you get refreshed, you refresh. You pour it back onto other people. And then Paul goes on to say, henceforth, there's a laid up for me a crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, shall give me on that day. And he didn't stop there. He said, and not only to me, but unto all them that love his appearing. Not to those that are going to lose their head, not to those who are in, uh, in prison, but to all those who are looking for his appearing. To stay faithful and loyal, just to stay for his appearing. Now, I can't remember, but he's telling me and Sister Lori, a pastor was on the way here, about a man in Japan who always rode the train in the mornings. And then he got back off in the afternoon. He had a dog named Hutcha. Yeah. And the dog, an Eskimo dog, would go out and walk with him to the train. And then, and then he'd get on the train. He'd ride the train. He'd come back in the afternoon. The dog would walk back from his house, wait on the man at the train, and then he'd walk back to his house. This dog would do this every day for that man. And one day the man had a heart attack and died. The dog waited for him at the train. The man didn't show. He went back home. The next morning the dog went back. For 10 years, this Eskimo dog... For 10 years, went back and forth that train waiting on his master, loyal and waiting. That was Paul the Apostle. That's me and you. We're waiting for his appearing. We're just waiting on his appearing. We keep, we keep coming to church. We don't quit church. We love the family of God. We keep praying. We keep believing. Amen. And as we're doing all that, we're waiting on Jesus to come back. Our master's coming again. Can I get an amen? amen. So with those final words, they executed Paul took his head. At that moment, he was set free from the attachments of this life. It was painful, no doubt, but well rewarded because of his faithfulness. He, re he mentions one man during this time. He calls his name Onesphorus, a help bringer. Amen. I want to draw your attention here. 2 Timothy 1 15. I back up one verse here. He says, This thou knowest that all they which are in Asia be turned away from me. They left me, of whom are Phagellus and Hermogenes. And I thought to myself when I read that, Paul named names. He named names. One thing I have never done is name names. I will die with so many secrets when people were dumb enough to think I was a priest and confess to me their stuff. Smile, because you know I'm telling the truth. I've been pastoring for 30 years. I got a wealth of gossip stored up. I got names. I got places. <laughs> I ain't naming them. I'm going to take them to the grave in Jesus' name. Amen? Amen. But Paul named them. He said, these two cats left me. Amen. They worked with me. Later on, he's going to say, Demas left me. Amen. He also left me. Amen. These guys walked away. In contrast to the actions and attitudes of many, there was one man. I just scared some of y'all, didn't I? Okay, all right. This one man who was kind to Paul, in the middle of all this, Paul makes reference to a man who brought great comfort to him. He was a man who helped him. His name, again, means help bringer. Paul stressed that this man refreshed him in the middle of struggling. It doesn't say how he done it. I believe he did it with his presence. Just showed up, just connected with him, just fellowshiped with him. 2 Timothy 1, 16 again, But may the Lord have mercy on the household of Onesiphorus. Many times did that man put fresh Fresh heart into me. This is fireworks week. And there's a lot of people's fire that quit working. But this man put fresh fire in my heart. When he got near me, he fired me up. Amen. He spoke. It, it, Paul actually says this. I think, and he was not in the least ashamed of me being a prisoner. One place said that he brought me the gospel. Here's a man who knows the gospel. But Onesimus brought more gospel to him, more good news to him. Amen. There's nothing like good news. Can I get an amen? 
J.B. Phillips, and again, he said, he put fresh heart in me. He gave me, heart means courage. He gave me courage. Maybe is what Paul needed to even go to, to die. A man gave him the courage to keep pressing on. We all need the ministry of refreshment. And perhaps more importantly, we need to be a person who gives themselves to refreshment. To do this, there's requirements. First requirement is about killing your pride. Getting rid of your pride. He said he was not ashamed of my chain. The word chain there means prison. The thing that I'm bound with at this moment. We are all susceptible to moments of pride that rob us from blessings. Imagine the stigma that Paul was on Paul's life at that time. He was a death row criminal. I mentioned to you, if you were connected with him, they're going to take you out. If you held the rope to help him escape, you was as guilty as he was. Amen. So here, to connect with Paul is trouble. From all the physical abuse he had endured, there's no doubt that his appearance was anything to look at. I believe Paul's body was scarred, that his, that his walk was limping. I believe that he had thorns that he talked about in his flesh. And, and not literal thorns, but something that he couldn't pray away, whether it was a bad eyesight or something physical or maybe a spiritual uh, uh, oppression following him, something that he said that God's grace is sufficient for me. But it meant he was going to have to risk. This man Onesimus would have to risk. If you're going to refresh and encourage someone, you're going to discover there's a cost involved in it. Oh, you can sit home. Or you can decide, you know what, I'm going to go to Florida and help somebody that went through a hurricane. I'm going to go to Louisiana and help somebody whose roof was tore off during a hurricane. Why would we even want to do that? Because we've been blessed during hurricanes. Amen. When people came and refreshed. That, that break in labor, I remember it well. We labored September, October, November, December, trying to repair buildings and, 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 and keep still having church on, on, on the midweeks and, and just Sundays and, and, and doing weddings and funerals and still doing everything we were doing. But on the flip side, whoa! Get out of there. there it is, just leaving. That's snot devil. <laughs> so on the flip side, and then there may be another one coming in a second, so hold on. But on the flip side, when, when we got a break, when that group showed up from California, it, it was like, I, I'm telling you, it made me weep. To see 20 men show up from another place, paid their own way, came and hang out with us, and just, it, it was the fellowship. It was the connection. And all of a sudden, I wasn't talking bad about California no more. Because right. <laughs> these relationships came into our life. And, you know, what we did for others is because of what, we, what was done for us. Chains, chains. There are chains that, that aren't physical. You don't see them. They don't blister the skin, but they ache the soul. They do stuff. To, there's chains of failure. There's chains of past scars and painful wounds. Chains of habits that return. Of violent tempers that resurface. Of poor self-image. Unemployment. Chains of financial pressure of the past. Chains of a future you're scared to face. Chains of fear that paralyzes us from unseen viruses or heights or enclosures or, or starting relationships. We had a lady on the tower yesterday. She got so scared when she's up there, she just grabbed hold of that big pole and held hold of it. And I mean, she wasn't going to let go. I told David to walk away from her because we already had her hooked up. It's just a matter of time till she wore out and let go. And eventually, we cut her loose. When she went down that zip line, and this is what's so funny to y'all. Y'all say, I never do that. She come back with a big old grin on her face, and that was so fun. And I think if we could help folks just overcome a little fear, imagine how much better your life would be. Yeah. Amen. That you could get back out and re-enter society. Don't be ashamed of the chain that belongs to somebody. You know, I, I, I have uh, uh, physical issues within my body. Amen. And because of that, I, I will read this. People have the same thing. And I'm thinking to myself, sometimes you just got to... Uh, <clears throat> don't be ashamed when I fall. Don't let it bother you. That I limp. That's what I love about this church. You know, you don't. Uh, uh, um, I look at H and, and uh, I'm forgetting your name right now, Goober. Uh, <laughs> what's that guy we play golf with? Bill. Bill. Oh, Craig. 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 <laughs> Can I ask you a question? Are you ever ashamed when somebody forgets your name? I'm, ser I'm being serious. As we get older, we all go into a time where we struggle with memory. And I've, I've loved Craig his whole life, <laughs> 25 years of his spiritual life. I mean, 
I take credit for it. But there's a flip side to it. Sometimes I'll ask somebody their name, and they look at me like, you've known me forever. Don't be ashamed if somebody starts skipping. You hear me? Don't be ashamed because they're limping. Don't be ashamed to be around them because they can't see like they used to. Don't be ashamed when you're around folk, amen, that, that are struggling, and they seem like they get up and down, up and down all the time. You've got to keep loving them. And that's what Paul was saying. This man was not ashamed of my chains, of my imprisonment, of where I was. Amen. It, it, did, it didn't affect him like it did others. If we're not careful, we can be too big to do something small and too small to do something big. A church needs men and women who will be to kill their pride and prejudice long enough to do something for the kingdom. And I thank God I pastor a church that people see. You know, when I go to the hospital, oftentimes I don't ask people how you got here, why you here. The issue is I came to refresh you. I'm here to pray for you. I'm here to pull for you. And the bottom line is because when I was in the hospital as a 14-year-old, I got visited. Amen. People drove 120 miles to come visit me and bring me a, a quarter pounder. My God, I couldn't get a quarter pounder when I lived at home. They refreshed me. Amen. They blessed me. And that caused an issue in my life when I, I do the best I can and, and try to encourage others to do the same thing, to go and see one another. It, it very well could be that God has blessed you with a heritage, a help, a gift, or the means to help someone beneath you who has a chain. Don't get too important to help someone who has a chain. It very well could be that on the end of the chain is Apostle Paul, someone like him. So Onesimus, his name goes down in history because he dared to do that. It's about responsibility. First, we kill pride, but it's also about responsibility. But when Onesimus was in Rome, he sought me out very diligently and found me. You know, I'm a recipient, again, of people who refresh me in my chains, and I've not forgotten them. There are times that if you are going to give yourself to the ministry of refreshment, and I'm talking about it's a ministry. What's your ministry? Refreshment? That's my man. If everybody in here would take on the ministry of refreshment, imagine how blessed this house would be. How blessed people out there would be. That every time we showed up, we refreshed somebody. It wasn't like, oh my God, lock the door. <laughs> here comes, here comes Phinehas or whoever that guy was. Amen. All they want to do is take. But to be a refresher, to be somebody that pours into somebody. There are times that if you're going to give yourself to the ministry of refreshment, you have to seek out an opportunity to do so. Well, I'm just going to wait till they need it. Not this man. Not Onesimus. He sought Paul. He went after him. He sensed the responsibility about him to go after him. And this is how great churches are built. People that go after and look for opportunities to be a blessing. Responsibility rings out of that passage. Amen. Now listen to me. This means that, on, and I can't prove this, you can't disprove it, but I believe in the book of Timothy, chapter, uh, 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 no, no, no. The book of Acts, and I've read the scripture several times to you. I think I even used it in some of our funerals. But, but the issue was that Onesimus was probably with Paul in Ephesus. He's one of the elders. And he heard something. And when he heard about Paul being in danger, he had to travel high seas just like Paul to get there. This means putting life on hold for an extended period of time. This means leaving the warmth of family and the camaraderie of friends. This means getting there at your own expense to do the will of God. Onesimus was noble-minded, strong-hearted man who had determined to give himself to the ministry of refreshment. That kind of devotion will knit the hearts of people in a church together. I read a story about a mountain climber. His name was Charles Houston. He overcame a climbing disaster in the Himalayan mountains in 1953. He wrote about what happens when men are concerned more about uh, themselves than others. He wrote, when men climb on a great mountain together, the rope between them is more than a mere physical aid to the ascent. It is a symbol of men banded together in a common effort of will and strength, fighting against their only true enemies, inertia, cowardness, greed, ignorance, fear, and all the weakness of the human spirit. I believe there is something that binds us together, and it's the love of Christ. Amen. It keeps us connected to refresh one another. The ministry of refreshment is a call to responsibility. It brings us together, and it has a reward. Everybody say reward. Woo! Amen. Don't you love rewards? Oh, if you'll find this dog, you get that reward. If this happens, you get that. There's a reward out. There's something about Here's what Scripture says. Paul said in 2 Timothy 1.18, The Lord grant unto him... 
Onesimus, that he may find mercy of the Lord in that day, there's that day, and in how many things he ministered unto me at Ephesus, you know very well. So Paul gives a small hint and defines the geographic location of Onesimus when he mentions the book of Ephesians. Now, I'm going to move quick here, but in Acts chapter 20, verse 31, Paul said, Be on your guard. Remember that for three years I never stopped warning each of you night and day with tears. I commit to you, God, through the word of his grace, which can build you up and give you an inheritance among all those who are sanctified. I have not covered anyone's silver or gold or clothing. You yourselves know that these hands of mine have supplied my own needs and the needs of my companions. In everything I did, I showed you that by this kind of hard work, we must help the weak. Remember the words the Lord Jesus gave. It's more blessed to give than receive. I believe. Again, I can't prove it because they don't tell us who the elders are. But the Bible says they embraced him. They cried as he left and got on the ship and went away to Rome. I believe that Onesimus was there. And he heard the words, more blessed to give than receive. And when that happened, it did something inside of him. When he heard that Paul was locked down, he decided that he had to leave Ephesus, turn Rome upside down until he could find him and bring him a ministry of refreshment. Nothing that you do for the kingdom of God will be unnoticed. Refreshment would be a good word. It could be your presence. In my mind, there, there are people watching me right now that refreshed me and blessed me and helped me. Amen. And I them. There's something about, and everybody here has a story. And if you don't, you're fixing the right one. Amen. Because your life has to be one of being a blessing to the other. And you need somebody. You need somebody. Joshua had Caleb. Somebody to climb a mountain with him. Uh, David had Jonathan. Amen. He loved Jonathan. Their souls were knit together. That, it, it's, it's an amazing story how much he loved Jonathan. Who was going to be the next king? Paul had Barnabas and Silas. Amen. The Lone Ranger had Tonto. Gilligan had Skipper. Marshall Dillon had Festus. Now, I love that you young people are scratching your head. You're going to have to Google them last three. But I hope you're smart enough to do it, because I'm going to tell you, them three guys meant a whole lot to us. I loved Festus. Amen. I loved Gilligan. And thank God for Tonto. He took all the whoopings. <laughs> Can I get an amen? And Paul had Onesimus. When you look at Paul's life, Paul had Silas. Paul had Barnabas. Paul poured into Timothy. But then Paul had Onesimus. We never read that they ran together. But we know that Onesimus went and found him. And when you walk through the story, I'm going to fix and close here. You go to a book. It's just one chapter long. Philemon. And Paul said this in the book. And we, we will take this book on Tuesday and Wednesday night and dissect it and walk through it and go a little deeper. But let me tell you what Paul said about Onesimus. Onesimus wasn't just anybody. He was a runaway slave. He was somebody. Had they caught him, they'd have killed him. And Paul, this is the thing about, stay Bible. Everybody say, stay Bible. Because if you don't stay Bible and you get in society, then all of the arguments break out. But if I stay Bible, I'm going to tell you that in Bible, there were slaves. In Bible, Paul told slaves to be good to their slave owners. It's, Paul told slaves to work for them just like you work for the Lord. Paul told them to respect them and honor them. You see, it was like an employer-employee that we've got today. As a matter of fact, servitude for many of them in that day was not what you hear about on our news and what we hear about in society today. It was more of somebody that took care of me while I take care of them. So Onesimus was a runaway slave. His owner was a man by the name of Philemon, a believer in Christ. And Paul speaks to Philemon because he knew him. And he lays it out. He said, therefore, although in Christ I could be bold, I could order you to do what you ought to do. In other words, you don't understand the, the power of the gospel. Amen. I've poured into your life, and I can tell you right now what you ought to do for him. It's powerful. Yet I prefer to appeal to you on the basis of love. Hmm. It, is if, it is as none other than Paul, the old man, and now also a prisoner of Jesus Christ. Did I tell you how old Paul was? But he hadn't made 50. You know what he said of himself? I'm an old man. You realize that our age, that 50 was considered old then? And now they won't let you die till you hit 100. And folk don't want to die. You know who wants to live to be 100? 
those who are 99. An old man now and also a prisoner of Christ Jesus. That I appeal to you for my son Onesimus. So Paul sends this letter and tells him, I'm going to appeal to you for Onesimus, who became my son while I was in chains. <laughs> he loved me. He refreshed me. Formerly he was useless to you, but now he has become useful both to you and to me. See, when I read this and I understand the storyline, Onesimus ran away as a slave. Then Onesimus meets up with Paul and gets saved. The gospel enters his life, changes his life, and now he feels like he owes a debt to a man who led him to Christ and taught him about Jesus. He said, I'm sending him who is my very heart back to you. So Paul hands Onesimus a letter, and he said, I want you to go back to your slave owner, and I want you to give him this letter. Well, you, there, there's probably a good chance to understand that Onesimus couldn't even read it because he's a slave. So he takes the letter and he brings it back to Philemon. He said, I'm sending you this. I would have liked to keep him with me that he could take your place in helping me while I'm in chains for the gospel. You know what he's saying there? Philemon, it should have been you here helping me. But no, you're a slave owner. You're a big shot. You got money and all this other stuff. But there was a runaway that got born again in my ministry. And he found me in my chains. And he refreshed me. It should be in you. So I'm sending him back to you. But I did not want to do anything without your consent. So that any favor you do would not seem forced, but would be voluntary. So he's used the word love. He's used the word voluntary. And perhaps the reason he was separated from you for a little while was that you might have him back forever. In other words, he's coming back with a different attitude. He's coming back with a working attitude. He's coming back with <sighs> brand new spirit. No longer as a slave, but better than a slave, a dear brother. So I don't want you to take him now as a slave. I want you to understand he's your brother. But even dearer to you, both as a fellow man and as a brother of the Lord. So if you consider me a partner, welcome him as you would welcome me. If he's done anything wrong or owes you anything, charge it to me. I'll take it. I, Paul, am writing this with my own hand. I will pay it back, not to mention that you owe me your very self. I've never looked at people and said, you know, the reason you're going to heaven is because you met me. I've never been that arrogant or thought that way. I've always considered it an absolute honor to preach the gospel and tell people about Jesus. And if they got saved, if they became a son or a daughter, then that's just on top. But the bottom line was, I'm just thankful to get to do it. But Paul's laying it out and saying, listen, the reason you're going to heaven, sir, is because I entered your life. They understood that eternity was greater than this physical pull to stay on this earth. And if I can get out of here by preaching the gospel, then I'll, I'll take, you can take my head. You can take John the Baptist's head. You can take James's head. You can take us. You, you pour oil on John. You, you can crucify Peter upside down. All our lives is about sharing the gospel. So I'm sending this slave back to you, but he's not a slave no more. He, he's your brother. And I want you to treat him like a brother. And if he owes you anything, I'll pay it. Now, how are you going to pay it, Paul, if you did? Paul said, I got you. And look, God owes me. He said, like, God owes me. So he's going to take care of you. He's going to bless you. I love it. I do not wish, brother, that I may have some benefit from you in the Lord. Refresh my heart in Christ, confident of your obedience. I write to you knowing that you will do even more than I ask. Well, you want to see some psychology in a written letter? I mean, he put some pressure on him. Not only are you going to take him back and not beat him and hurt him or kill him for running away, but you're going to make him your brother. And if he owes you anything, you charge that to me. Anything you need, I got you. And on the flip side of all that, I need you to understand <laughs> that I'm confident that you're going to treat him more than even I ask. And then I love this last verse, verse 22. He said one more thing. Prepare a guest room for me because I hope to be restored to you in answer to your prayers. 
to the best of my knowledge, Paul was never restored to him. He died before he could go back and visit him. But what he did is he set the guy up in such a way that Paul may show up. And if he shows up, I better be treating that man really good. Amen. I better be treating him like my brother. I better be telling everybody, that man right there refreshes me as I refresh him. I'm going to make sure. So I'm preparing a room for Paul. Well, they didn't have text messages and emails and things. He didn't know Paul had died yet. It was probably years later before he ever found out Paul died. But he still had a little room for him. And he was still treating that man well. You follow the preacher now? This is preaching so much better than I thought it would. I close with a verse here, the two. Second Corinthians 1 says, All praise to God, the Father of our, our Master, Jesus the Messiah. Father of all mercy, God of all healing counsel. He comes alongside us when we go through hard times. And before you know it, he brings us alongside someone else who is going through hard times so that we can be there for the person just as God was there for us. Why are you going through a hard time? Probably for somebody sitting in front of you. Somebody behind you. Why do I have to go through all that? To help somebody else that's going through it. Who will help somebody else that's going through it to help somebody else that's going through it? I looked around on a Tuesday of last week and realized we had two new widows in our church. Patsy, you being one of them. Behind you is another widow. And I think to my over there's another widow. And I think to myself, God, why, why are we going through this? And then I keep reading the scripture. It reminds me that I'm going through something to help somebody else. And it, that somebody else is somebody you refresh. Somebody that needs a break from labor. Well, it may not be they've got a pick beating up on rock, but they're, they're laboring through life. They're struggling with things. And if we would take up that ministry of refreshment, you can't do it first without repentance. Go to the last slide, please, sis. Hey, Amen. The last slide here. Repent then and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out. Repentance is what? To repent means to get back in the penthouse. It's to start over again. It's to get back in the high place. Hey, Amen. It's not a bad thing. It's a good thing. Say, so God, forgive me of my sins. That time's of... Tommy, I got a brand new truck. You got the same truck almost. Just an uglier color. <laughs> and I sit down in that truck. And I've been out on that ropes course. <laughs> I got sweat rolling, you know. It ain't the AC that does it for me. But I got a button that I can hit. And it's got these, uh, I don't know. They're political seats. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, they're political. They're always blowing cool air up my backside. <laughs> But I, but I hit that button, and all of a sudden, <laughs> refreshed. And there's some of you, get, I get around Kenny, and it's just like I hit that button. Just to see you refreshes me. Just to have hear your voice refreshes me. Just to know you pressing on, you didn't give up, refreshes me. Amen. To know that we pour into each other's life refreshes one another. Repent. Well, I'm already saved. <laughs> Didn't say you weren't going to heaven. I'm just saying you're cold and dry. I'm just saying you're cold and you're dry. You're dusty. Chafed. You need to be refreshed. Blessing from another. How'd I get that? Repent. God forgive me. Come on, just lift your hands right now. Close your eyes with me. Why don't we just do it together? Lord, forgive me. Forgive me for the failures of blessing others, for not seeking opportunities to refresh others. Forgive me in a world going to hell for not telling them about Jesus. Help me be more like you in Jesus' name. Amen. Come on, keep those hands up. 
Keep those hands up. No, no, no. Keep those eyes closed. Refresh us, God. Come, just, just pour it on us. Let us sense you. A young man came up to me and said, Father, he said to me, Pastor, I got filled with the Holy Ghost this week. That's refreshing. Amen. Cool air, refreshing. Cold water, refreshing. Drink from me, you'll never thirst again. Refreshing. By the well of life, refreshing. God, we thank you to refresh us. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Now give God praise in this house. <laughs> Pastor, I need a ministry. I just gave you one. I want a ministry. I just gave you one. Be the head of your own ministry. You have the ministry of refreshment. Amen. Whatever that may mean, just your neighbor, somebody around, you start refreshing people. Go wash their car. Go mow their grass. Y'all know I've mowed people's grass before. I've mowed people's grass I ain't even told y'all about. I'm saving it for sermons years from now. But I've mowed their grass. I just go over and mow their grass. I have never had anybody say, you can't, you can't mow my grass. You can't wash my car. The only people I won't let wash my car is David's three kids. <laughs> so I say, hey, Pastor, I'll wash your motorcycle. Sure, Joseph, go ahead. Amen. Well, that's, it. that's refreshing because that's what we do for one another. So now you've got a ministry. Everybody say, I got a ministry. Come on, say it. I got a ministry. Yeah, you do. Yeah, you do. You can get you a little business card now. Put your name on it. Minister so and so. Ministry of refreshment. Amen. If I get our servant leaders to come up. Without me making some big ado of this, would you commit to help it today? And you go online and give it, holywild.net slash give. Just an extra $125. Again, I'm going to give an extra $500 this week. I'm already going to commit, I told Pastor Joseph, to the youth next week. But this week's about kids camp. That you would commit extra money this week toward kids camp. I just want to see if you would do that. If that's you, lift your hand. You'll do that. You'll help us out this week. You don't have to. I don't you feel the pressure unless you want to. But I want you to be able to give thank you. Just like I am toward our kids. That way we can bless them. Because Marley keeps sending me messages saying, Pastor, we might need this for our kids. I'm going to do it. I ain't backing off. I want our kids blessed. I want them to have three fantastic days. And I'm going to be there. Amen. I'm going to be with them. So I'm, I'm looking forward to being there. And I want you. If you would like to come out, what, what days are we doing ropes? Thursday, Friday, Saturday. What time in the morning? 10 o'clock in the morning. If you'd like to come and join us at 10 o'clock in the morning. I mean, Keith Sanders has been there all summer. Coming out, hanging out with us. Come join us. Yeah, we'll make sure you don't get too hot. We'll put you under the shade. We'll give you plenty of water. I can put you on the tower with me. It doesn't mean you're going off. It just means you're going to be called a hooker. I had, a, I had a, a chubby hooker with a beard up there yesterday. His name was Mickey. Some of y'all know Mickey. <laughs> so, amen. So if, uh, and I, don't, I didn't mean that offensive. Don't you take it wrong. I'm a lightning rod for offense. Boy, I say the wrong thing. So it's important you give today. So as we give, we're believing God for... More money, less hours. Benefits, sales and commission, checks in the mail, gifts and surprises, bonded money, bills paid off, settlements, inheritance, rebates and returns, debts demolished, royalties received, favor, success to the kingdom. Amen.